Welcome to Quantum Leap. I'm your host, Toyin UMSTV. And today we also have a very special guest with me here in studio in downtown Aurora, the second largest city in Illinois. And I want to welcome you, Miss Lisa, to Quantum Leap. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. It's a pleasure and it's a pleasure to come to Aurora. Awesome. So let me share a little bit about Miss Lisa. Ms. Lisa Victoria Waller, also maiden name Anderson, is the president and co-owner of BDG International Inc. located in Elgin, Illinois. BDG International was founded in 1983 by the Anderson family and is a full service international freight forwarder, US custom broker, FTC and trade consultant, and BDG is a proud recipient of the President's E Award for Excellence in Exporting from the United States Department of Commerce Secretary in 2013. In 2007, Ms. Lisa and her partners also opened BDG International in India and Mumbai. So that's really amazing with you shared some of that story with us. Ms. Lisa is appointed member of the Illinois District Export Council, where she serves as executive secretary for the IDEC. And also she's the vice president of the Chicago Customs Broker and Forwarder Association. Welcome again to Aurora. Thank you. I've been looking forward to our conversation because I really want to know, what do you do? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a big question. Big question, right. yes. Uh, well, my, my daily job is I'm president of BDG International. So as you said, we're international freight forwarder, customs broker. Um, my main job is to lead our team. And our, our company is a family owned company and we're competing against the largest freight forwarders in the world. They have hundreds of thousands of employees and we're here in Illinois, homegrown, and we have a great staff and we can compete against the best. And we are one of the best. And by doing that, we have a great team and we have created that great team through uh, education and um, being loyal to our employees and creating loyalty back, which offers our clients the ability to have a really great dynamic for consulting and for having true honor and having you know that advice that they need to go to places where that might be difficult, might be difficult to make decisions and understand the marketplace overseas. Fantastic. In my mind, I see your work as a backbone support to export development. So for those businesses that want to go international and have questions around the logistics, right? So there's the transaction side of export, there's the financing side of export, there's the negotiation side of export. But in terms of the supply chain infrastructure standpoint, right? How do they know who to go to? For example, the services you offer, because for me, what I've seen is that people don't even know they need this type of service. So why should they come to you first? And in terms of the backbone support that you offer for you know, companies here in Aurora that might need that support, at what point should they be reaching out to your company? Well, I say it's typical that uh, someone finishes a transaction, they sell a product, they plan to export it overseas, and so they happen to need the service. It's just a need, right? And they, they, the transaction happens and perhaps they continue to do it and they're, they're stumbling along the way. Mm. Uh, so the first part is whether you're an experienced exporter or a new exporter, if there is a new lane, a new country that you're getting involved in, a uh, new product that you're involved in, to reach out to a log logistics provider or consultant, and we can do that through the ILDEC. So if you don't know where to go and you're creating a new product, or you're creating a new service, you go to the ILDEC and you provide them all the details that you're looking at doing and then they'll open up a lot of those resources uh, and able to customize to your needs. Right. Uh, but with that said, it's good, there's two parts. There's understanding the front end, what does that look like? What's the big picture of international logistics? Mm -hmm. Developing a plan and then maybe for a six months or a year, you might not have an export, mm. but it's good to get that plan set in place yeah and have an idea of the questions to ask when you go to sign those contracts, when you go to renegotiate renego anything. Yeah. And then because part of the negotiation of selling the product is who's going to pay for the transportation, mm. right? And part of, of who's gonna pay for the transportation the is who's funding 
So if you're funding through Exxon Bank, they're going to have regulations that you have to comply with. If you're funding through a letter of credit, you have regulations. And if you're funding on your own, well, you have good practices that you need to keep. So in all cases, you need to upfront understand that so when you're negotiating, you can include that in your contracts. Then on the back end is now at the shipping part. You actually have made the sell. You're going to start producing. It's good to have a preliminary bid so you have understanding of that lane. See if anything's changed mm -hmm. in the last year while you were preparing and work out those kinks. And then when you actually go to ship, to start shipping and uh, solidify the pricing and then start going through the processes. And then the last part would be process improvement. Uh, so it's an ever-changing environment in international trade. So it shouldn't just be something, oh, we got a product today, we're gonna ship it out. That works because we are very fortunate to have some very good integrated carriers that are shipping our small packages and pouches. Uh, so you know they make things really easy, right? Which is great. The products are typically low value, they're going to countries that are easy to get to. But what happens when that actually becomes a full mm -hmm. container or a large air freight shipment or something high value? Now you start dealing with different types of rules with uh, shipping and customs overseas. So it's really a, 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 a thing that you have to plan for and it's something that has to have process improvement. Fantastic. And in the last three years with COVID, we've heard a lot about supply chain challenges. From your expertise, what would we say the current landscape, what does it look like today? Well, I, I give you an example. I go down the street to the dry cleaners. Maybe we had 10 dry cleaners in the city that I live in. Uh, five of them are gone. Oh, wow. Okay. That's what you should expect in transportation. Wow. Uh, the carriers, the service, provi the service providers, uh, the, the shipping lanes, uh, everything has changed. Wow. So if you expected it, for example, uh, you know, I'm, American Airlines had direct flights to India. Mm -hmm. They no longer have direct flights to India from Chicago because we are not, as per U.S. government rules, allowed to fly our planes over Russian territory mm. for the security. So that's a security issue. Another issue might be due to sanctions. And another issue might be that the carrier itself doesn't have the profit center to service that market anymore because COVID took away that, that supply and demand and everything shifted. And as everything shifts, now you have new processes in place, new logistics lanes in place. And you have to kind of reinvent that search again. And I'll give you another example that is very similar here domestically is that we all might know that Yellow has uh, gone bankrupt and they closed their doors. There were over 100,000 employees. Well, that covered 10% of our domestic movement of freight and was a huge service provider to Canada. Who's filling that gap now? Well, it's not so easy to absorb 10% into every trucker in the United States to move that cargo. So now there's a lot of disruption domestically. Wow. Our domestic disruption can affect our international trade. So we always have to be looking at both sides of the coin and understanding if we're going to make a promise to our buyer overseas, mm -hmm. that we're being realistic, we're being honest, and we're providing them a plan on how we're gonna solve these problems. Fantastic. So the plan you're talking about does it happen before the transaction or as the transaction uh, documents are being prepared? This is also a requirement that an exporter needs to consider. Sure. Now, we have, we have shipments that are repeat shipments. You know, the buyer's repetitive. Uh, you know, that is something that somebody is going to take, you know, tweak the pricing, tweak the service, make sure everything's working well. Um, and hopefully the, cha the services aren't changing. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see if it's a new lane. It's the new lanes that you've been preparing for right. that you haven't really tested out those routes. Uh, and no matter, you know, even if it's a thousand dollar transaction or it's a million dollar transaction, that transaction is very important to the exporter. Yes. And those routes need to be vetted out and solidified. So it's good to plan in advance and then check it again right before you plan on shipping to make sure everything's in place. Wow, that's amazing. So this is fantastic. Here in Aurora, right? So. I'm, I'm hearing you say you need to have a plan for your logistics as you start considering to export. And that plan it in of itself needs to, it can evolve based on current lanes, yes. current um, policies, <laughs> current uh, costs. Wow. Is that from an exporter standpoint, how do they tap into this kind of knowledge base? If you're new to export and this is something you've never done before, right? 
you know, we have the IADEC. Do we just come to the IADEC, go to our website, if they have any questions around this type of conversation right, we're they, having? They start that pile. You know, it's all about where you're marketing your product to. Okay. And like Sam had said in the earlier session, you know, okay, there's two ways of selling your product overseas. There's one, getting an order because someone found your product online or from marketing, mm -hmm. which is great. Then you don't really know the market that you're selling to. You're, you're servicing that company who wants to buy right. the product. But if you want to be a consistent exporter and grow your export, you want to learn the markets that you're going to sell to. Okay. And part of learning those markets is understanding the transportation, right? Understanding logistics. Now, some companies will have a philosophy that they're going to sell the product and they're going to let the buyer overseas pick up at their door, right? Which is what we call an FCA term or an XWorks term. Uh, in that case, that's okay, it works. However, you're not really getting to know the economy that you're shipping to. You're mm -hmm. not really getting to know the service available. So it doesn't make your company as dynamic as it needs to be to really integrate into that country. Okay. And if you really wanna have more than one buyer in a country and you wanna have a diversity in that country, you wanna start getting to know their culture, uh, what their needs are from a logistics point of view, right. and what their concerns are versus then just saying, oh, pick it up at my door, I don't wanna be involved in it. I love what you're saying because it goes into short-term exporting versus long-term. Yeah. So in the long-term, you want to do more than just shipping, you want to go deeper and finding newer buyers, right? So that you can increase the right. volume going into that country. But what I've seen is that in the short-term, people just want to sell. Right, <laughs> well, of course, everybody wants to sell their product, but I think, you know, it's great to sell. Uh, but if you want to have an export strategy, yes. now that's something that the ILDEC can offer is uh, amongst our volunteers, there's an individual who might have a, a process in creating a strategy. You can also get support from the state of Illinois and from the U.S. Export, Cons export Assistance Center. Wow, this is so good. Thank you so much because now I'm seeing it as you can start. We, we want to encourage people to start, learn, grow but also to start thinking long-term because if you have consistent shipment going to a country, you can easily ramp up volume by building more relationships there. Mm, right, right. Wow. So, and then go to countries that you might not consider. A lot of people mm -hmm. will go to the country that they're most aligned to ethnically, right? Which is great yeah. because they understand that culture, but the laws of that country might not be uh, approachable. For example, the United States has about 21 foreign trade agreements, and those foreign trade agreements are with countries to inspire trade, and they've created an easier barrier to get into that country, so they've lowered the barriers of entry. Yes. So that might not be where you're ethnically used to trading with, mm -hmm. right? So getting to know that culture, understanding why would we have a trade agreement with that area, and what does that benefit us? So for example, selling your product to the European market, which requires a CE mark, and has a lot of restrictions locally on products and how they're made and what they're made of. Uh, while a lot of our free trade agreement countries, they have agreed to take our certifications and adopt them. Mm. So that's gonna create a lower barrier and a lower cost. The same thing is if you're selling to Europe and you're selling your product, a lot of the buyers will have you deduct their VAT. So that let's say is between 18 to 24%. Wow. So here you're selling a product and they're like, yeah, we're happy to buy your product. We want to distribute your product, but we need you to lower the cost 24% so we can sell it throughout the entire Europe and we can then charge our VAT on top of that. That's very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. So is that the best market to go after first wow. or, or continue to expand when we have these other markets? There's, they're happy to work with us and happy to adopt our certifications and don't have these type of VAT restrictions. Wow, that's so much great information. So it's actually also looking at demand and supply, where the demand is more favorable, also given the free trade agreement, pricing, negotiate. That, it feels like there's a lot to think about <laughs> when it's time to export, but the good news I'm also hearing is that we have great people that can walk us through each, every step of the way and help you ad address those questions. Yeah, and then just recently, I've been to a few, quite a few events regarding, you know, accessing the African market. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's, you know, many countries in Africa, many different cultures. And, and, you know, the African customs regulations have changed over time now. 
they don't want used products. Mm -hmm. They want high quality products and they want US products, US made products. So the customs regulations have actually started to alter what's allowed to be imported so that, you know, there's countries that are not becoming dumping grounds of cheap goods, mm -hmm. used goods and stuff that people don't want. Mm -hmm. They want to evolve their country themselves. And so these are interesting markets and there's a lot of support through the U.S. government in helping accessing those markets to see if we can compete. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yes, talking about Africa, what I say is listen to the demand signals. So to your point, there's a growing middle class and even the business community that, that are consuming industrial equipment, industrial products, agricultural products, uh, mechanized, right? Anything to support um, economic development of different sectors and different industries. I've also seen that there's now increased demand for higher quality US made products. Right. So thank you for bringing that up. That's definitely something we're watching closely. So for us here in Aurora, what else do we need to think about? What's your parting words for those of us in Aurora about the, the opportunities for sure. Aurora? I guess going back to the real basics on number one, why do we need export, right? We've mentioned it a couple different times on the development of the economy, the security, the job security. Um, but, but even to bring it down to even a, a, a more simplistic level, I like to talk about it about the household, right? So you have two parents, two kids, four person household. And you know, the children are getting to that age, 15, 16, and mom and dad say, you gotta go to get a job, <laughs> right? So child number one gets a job and brings in $50 a week after taxes into the household. That's $2,200 a year. Mm. That's actually a significant amount of money to the household budget that mom and dad are no longer having to pay out of their own pocket. Well, this is the same way that export works. Mm. If we look at the US economy as our household or the Aurora economy as our household, and we export a product outside of the country, which is outside of our home. Mm. And we bring home $50 into our pocket as a company after taxes, right? Think about how many jobs, you know, the jobs, everything it took to manufacture that, export it and, re and, and bring in money for that. That's just like that household. So this is, it's exponential on how export develops the economy. Uh, and with that saying in Aurora, Aurora has, is that probably I would say there are not that many cities in the United States that have the mix of what we need that Aurora has. Mm. Number one, you do have that land that can continue to be developed. You have a highly educated um, workforce and you have a workforce that's willing to work from the ground level and learn and go up. You also have an excellent community college training program for technical services all through Kane County. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, you have the entertainment district, district and you have a nice place to live and you have nice surrounding suburbs. So you really have a lot that it takes to be a great place to have a manufacturing site. Yeah. The other thing that you have is that we are in Kane County. Mm -hmm. uh, so Kane County has lower taxes for businesses, lower taxes for real estate, and they're very pro-business. So I think it's a great mixture and I don't think that there's many counties that have what we have here around the country. Wow, thank you so much. This is great news, uh, <laughs> we're in the right space. And before I let you go, I would also like to ask, you know, the leadership question around your leadership success secrets, uh, one or two tips for our audience that, you know, for those young coming behind us, trying to also um, achieve success, what one or two things would you love to share with my audience? Sure, well, the first thing I tell a young generation is, um, whether you've gone through the university route or you've gone into business straight up, uh, there is a lot of learning that has to do in any individual industry. So go and find certifications in your industry. Okay. Every industry has certifications. Every industry has a journal and every industry has an association. Okay. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of free resources in those associations for young people who want to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a weeks of vacation, go to a, an association conference, right? Invest in yourself. Yes. And by investing in yourself and not waiting for someone to pay for it, but mm -hmm. you know, taking care of that on yourself, whether it's time and it's free, mm -hmm. or it's a small amount of money, your vacation money that you're investing in yourself to go to a conference, 
yeah. you will find that that will not only change yourself, mm. but it will also expand your environment. Wow. And then the second thing is, uh, is if, you know, in any position really, in having a, a vision for your own career and for my career, I was fortunate to come into a family company but you know, it could be a situation that you know there is not a lot of opportunity in a family company. There is no <laughs> large ladder to climb, uh, so we had to create my own ladder, oh, right? Wow. And we had to expand our company, expand our vision. And the only way we could get that done is by depending on a wonderful team and continuing to educate our team and invest in our team as employees. So employees are number one in any company that's succeeding. Number two are the customers that you're taking in. Mm -hmm. You know, making sure that your collaboration with the customers and that you're honest with the customers on the services that you can provide or the product that you can provide. Yeah. And with that said, then you should be able to succeed. Oh, thank you so much. I'm super honored to, you know, serve with you on the Illinois District Expert Council, and I'm sure we're going to do great work together. So thank you so thank much, you. My pleasure. Ms. Lisa, for being here. And thank you everyone for joining us again on the Quantum Leap Show. I'm sure the information you just got is really going to be a game changer for taking your business to the next dimension. Thank you again and see you next week. Bye.